let's maybe start this conference by looking at the edge of plant biology, which people don't normally think about in connection with food security and in connection with some of the societal problems that we, the human species, face. So I'll just talk a bit about plant hunting. Now, we live on an incredible planet. We live on an, on an increasingly pressured planet, as John has very clearly showed us in the last half hour. But we also live on a planet which is full of diversity of not only plants, but of other species of animals like us. The diversity with which we share the planet is absolutely phenomenal. We know a lot more about our planet now than we ever have before. We often talk about the fact that we don't know much about biodiversity, but actually we know a lot. If you look at this map, which is the map that was published in 1704 by Sir Hans Sloane, whose collections founded the Natural History Museum in which I work, and you can see that they, you know, they weren't quite firm on kind of the outlines of places. So we weren't really clear. There's a place called Wild Brazil down there in the bottom, which is always quite exciting. And today, any one of us can go onto our computers and look at the world in a completely different way. Imagine what it must have been like to not really know what the world was like. All of us in this room for our whole lives have really known a lot about the earth we live on. Now, we owe this a lot to people who explored in the past, people like Sir Joseph Banks, who was rather famously president of the Royal Society for 40 years, after which time they decided to limit the term of presidency because they got so sick of him. And he, when he was a young man, paid to circumnavigate the globe with Captain James Cook, and he lived in this small cabin for something like five years and collected plants and animals all over the world. And he, again, you think about going to Australia and thinking about what you might see. This is Sidney Parkinson, who was his artist. And you can't see it very well because it's quite a low light image. But this is Sidney Parkinson's drawing of a kangaroo. Now, any one of us in this room, if we shut our eyes right now, we could imagine what a kangaroo looked like, couldn't we? Everyone's seen a picture of a kangaroo. Imagine trying to draw a kangaroo when you'd never seen anything like it before. So we really do know quite a lot. Plant hunting, as opposed to kangaroo hunting, is often depicted as a romantic sort of thing to have happen. The plant hunters, there are books written called The Plant Hunters. Um, Frank Kingdon Ward uh, collected plants for the horticultural industry in Burma and Tibet. And this picture on the, um, on the other side of the screen is Chinese Wilson, Ernest Wilson, who again collected in the, in the river, in the Irrawaddy River drainages and famously dressed as a coolie and escaped with his life um, various times. So plant hunting is often thought of as being very romantic. And Jim even sort of referred to my adventures as being quite romantic. But I think, as I hope to show you, they're quite prosaic. But they actually also give us information which we really need as part of the base to not underst un only understand plant diversity, but also to address some more serious societal questions. Other things we found out from people who have explored plant diversity is just how climate and position influence how and where plants grow. This is a statue of Sir Alexander von Humboldt, which is in um, Venezuela, which is where he famously explored in the early part of the 19th century. And after his explorations in the Andes, he came up with a model of how latitude and elevation interacted together to show how, how, why plants grow where they do and why vegetation on mountains is distributed in the way it is. Now, that model of plant, of plant distribution is what we use to, what climate scientists actually use today to look at how, climate, how the climate is changing the distribution of plants. So that comes from people who could have been characterized as plant hunters. But maybe we know enough about the diversity of life on Earth. This is a map of the records which are held in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility in 2008. But you can see that we know, we know a lot. These are records of things people have seen, organisms people have seen. This isn't just plants, this is animals as well. We know tons of stuff. Now looking at this graph, the, the sort of more alert amongst you will note that if you, if you take this as being red as being lots of biodiversity and yellow as being very little, that there's lots and lots of biodiversity in the United States and Europe and very little in the tropics. In fact, this means there's lots of bird watchers in the United States and Europe because over 75% of these records of people observing biodiversity are birds. So this is essentially a bird watcher's index. Now, it doesn't mean we should discount this completely, but plant scientists need to get in there and get their data up into the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. 
So maybe we know enough about where things are distributed, and we should just concentrate on those few species which we know and love that we know we can improve. Maybe we should just not worry about the diversity of plants and just get on with improving our food. I hope that after the half hour that I have, and I hope to leave enough time for some questions at the end, is that, that I can convince you that perhaps that wouldn't be such a hot idea. So here's just a few factoids about plant diversity. About 80% of human caloric intake comes from six, count them, one hand plus one thumb species of flowering plants. We currently think there are probably about somewhere between 400 and 500,000 species of flowering plants on this earth. So if we're only using six, what are all the rest of those doing there? Do we care about them at all? Which is a question which is a bit rhetorical, but we'll come to that. We describe something like 2,000 new ones every year. So new species are discovered at the rate of about 2,000 a year. But half of all the species that we know about, and that includes accepted species and non-accepted species, which I'll talk about in a minute, are only known from the one collection that someone made at the time they were discovered. So that means we know lots of things, and we know absolutely nothing about most of them. And also, using calculations from a number of different ways of calculating this, we, we think that about 20% of all plant species, and this is all plants, not just flowering plants, is threatened with extinction. So 20% of all of plant diversity is threatened, and we know almost nothing about half of it. So that's a bit of a problem. That means we don't know very much about quite a lot. So this is where exploration comes in, and exploration and documenting diversity. Now, Frank Kingdon Ward and Ernest Wilson, when they were plant hunters in Burma and Tibet, would go out there and collect seeds for the horticultural industry. And many of the seeds of the things that we grow in our gardens actually came from their expeditions. Frank Kingdon Ward brought back blue poppies, which people in British gardeners cultivate assiduously and fail most of the time. They, they aren't particularly successful. I've tried a couple times, and I always fail. So these places, you can go to, go to places and find new things. And this, of course, does involve excitement. It involves some people, not me, because I fall out when I try to climb trees. Climbing trees, it involves getting cars unstuck. But the results of these are held in collections, which are really important collections. And there's one such collection here, which is of wheat seeds, which is a really important national collection of something. And you wouldn't think a place like the John Innes Center had a collection that was important for documenting diversity but it does. And all of these, the UK is particularly rich in these sorts of collections. This is a picture of the um, old herbarium in the Natural History Museum. Now, the, thing, the way that plant hunters work, and people like me work, is we go out and we don't do like bird watching and just say, I saw a sparrow at 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday at the corner near the Emirates Stadium in London. It's what we make is we make a specimen of what we see. We make a specimen which is, which is a voucher, which is almost, it's like having a physical point in a database. Now, the interesting thing about plant specimens is they really haven't changed. So the technology that I use, and I hate to admit it in such august company, the technology I use is exactly the same as that that Linnaeus used in 1753. I press plants between sheets of paper, dry them, mount them on card, make a label, and put it in the collection. Now, the one thing you can see from these three plant specimens, there's one from the 1700s, one from the 1800s, and one from the 1900s, is they're very similar. They show us about plant variation, which is really important, and I'll come to in a minute, but they obviously had more time to make them look nice in the 1700s than we do today. Mine are lovely like this, of course. And the way we collect this, as I said, is basically exactly the same. Getting things from trees can be tricky. You can climb them, or you can use these... Um, Pole clippers. Have any of you ever seen people kind of repairing telephone poles with those long, extendable poles? Well, we carry those in the field to get plants up in the trees. And then you press things amongst, between pieces of papers. And I always, when I show this picture, I always have to point out that all those beer cans were not due to me. <laughs> but actually, those specimens themselves become a real frontier for species discovery. In a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2010, the, um, they analyzed the fraction of specimens remaining to be described versus the time since collection. And it turns out that most new species are described from specimens that were collected <coughs> about 70 years ago. So the specimens that I collect on a, on a, on a trip probably will, won't be described for another 50 years. 
So sitting in all those collections is also diversity that remains to be described. And this is just an example of one that, we, that I found in Paris that had not been, um, I had known it was new, but it had sat in the Paris collections and had been collected by that very same Alexander von Humboldt when he was in uh, Santa Fe de Bogota in Colombia. But collecting itself is becoming increasingly more problematic and increasingly difficult. In the days of Humboldt and Banks, and even in the days of Frank Kingdon Ward, you could just pack your kit bag, get in a boat, and just go and collect plants and bring them back, be it for the horticultural industry or be it for the Natural History Museum or for the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew or at Edinburgh. The world is not the same anymore. All of our countries are signatories to something called the Convention on Biological Diversity. The one big holdout in all of this is the United States, but the United Kingdom is a signatory to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which regulates access to genetic resources. Now, everyone in this room knows that plants are an enormous genetic resource. Our own species is a huge genetic resource. So as a result, getting permission to collect plants is becoming more and more difficult, and getting permission to actually share the results of that, those collections and the share of that diversity amongst the scientific community has been difficult for about the last couple of decades. But things are changing with something called the Nagoya Protocol, which was signed in, in Japan in Nagoya at the last conference of the parties of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is aiming to open up the free interchange of genetic resources for bona fide scientific research. And I think we really need to think about this, and I think all of our communities, for all our plant science communities, needs to take the CBD seriously, but also think about in what ways we can, we can help with this to help facilitate further scientific research. But the CBD has made things quite difficult. Now, there's basically two sorts of plant collecting or plant hunting that people do today in the 21st century. The first of which is to go somewhere where people haven't been before. And that may seem crazy that there are places on Earth where people haven't been before, where scientists have never been. But there, let me tell you, there are quite a few of them. So this is a place in Panama where we walked in for three days and stayed there for three weeks. And in those sorts of, of field trips, one collects absolutely everything. Because people may not go back there. And often, also what happens is that when you do go somewhere, you come back three months later or three years later, and it's gone. It's been turned into agriculture, as John has shown in Africa, as does happen with increasing land. Now, one of the reasons for doing this is that if you look at where habitats occur, one of the ways that we can look at where habitats occur on Earth is we can use models which are based on collections which are held in herbaria. And this is, a, this is a map of the biome of tropical dry forest, which is one of the most endangered habitats in South America, done by a postdoc of mine, Tina Sarkinen. And what she did is she took species of plants that are known to be endemic to this area, and she modeled where they would occur based on the herbarium collections. Now, that is all fine and good. But what if there's a place which has got lots of tropical dry forest, but no one has collected there? and there are no collections from there. This is the Rio Pampa in Peru, which we recently collected in. Um, and this there, I had never seen collections from this area before. So there, there are places which are really obvious, which we need to collect in. The other way that people tend to collect is they collect for a specific purpose, for specific families and areas of research. Now this actually is easier to get permission for. So the trip I've just come back from, Jim referred to that I'm just back, I'm just back from two months in the field in Argentina and Peru. And I had a permit to collect the plant family that I study, which is, this, which is Solanaceae, which includes tomatoes and potatoes and all their kind of family fun friends. And in this way, you cover a lot of ground, but you very specifically collect only that one family. Now, for someone like me who just likes plants in general, it's really, really hard to go in the field and kind of pass all this quite cool stuff by that you know you can't collect because you don't have permission. And I don't do it because without permission, not only I'm in trouble, my institution is trouble, and the UK is in trouble. So it's really important that we stick to that permission. So we went collecting Solanaceae. So what I'd like to talk to you about is really why we still need plant collections today. And I'll use two examples, one from Peru, well, three examples, one, two from Peru and one from Argentina. Now, as I said, most of these, mo many plant species are only known from their type collections. So they're really only known from one place. 
And in 2009, I described a species of selenum, which we called Selenum anomalostemon, because it has very odd-looking anthers. It's a very peculiar-looking plant on a herbarium sheet. And I'd never seen this plant alive. I described it purely from the specimen from a collection that had been collected in 1930. So there you go. Quite, quite a long time between its collection and its description. So we went specifically back to the place where this had been collected. Didn't find it there, but found it in a similar area by trying to say, okay, if it was here once, what kind of habitat might it have been? Which now means we know lots, lots more about this particular species. We can get DNA sequence out of it. We know what habitat it grows in. We know what its fruits look like. We know what sort of forest it's in. We know much more about it than we did in that paper, which was published in 2009. And that's really important because that particular species is as peculiar in life as it was in the herbarium specimen. And it may have something in it that will tell us something about not only diversity, but something that we might want to use later. I'd never been to Argentina before, and the Argentina, I've spent a lot of time in Peru, but I've never been to Argentina before, and the Argentinian Andes were a huge revelation because they were extremely dry, and I had always thought of the Andes as being quite wet. And people have worked a lot in Argentina, and there is a lot of diversity there, and I'll tell you the story of what I call the story of Selenum salicifolium, which I think illustrates why it's really important to, to look at plants in the field. When we will look at plants as single individuals, and I would argue that we sequence genomes of single individuals. We know the Arabidopsis genome, we know the human genome, we know the potato and tomato genomes, but it's changing quickly. But those are single individuals, and they're highly modified single individuals. Plants in the field do very peculiar things. Selenum salicifolium was described in the 1800s by someone from Mendoza in, in central Argentina. And we went looking for this particular plant and found this whole series of things which looked a bit like it. So there's something that grows as a big vine coming out through dry acacia trees. There's something that grows with fleshy leaves, something with big leaves, and then this squitty little plant, which is about this big, which is basically the same thing. Looking at all of these, if you had a single individual of each of these, you would say, those are all completely different. Those are all completely different things. But what we found was, in fact, on a single individual, you got all the leaf variation within this entire set of things which were called different species. So what we've done is we've called it Selenum salicifolium, and all the other species names become synonyms. Now, this doesn't mean that those were wrong. It means that those people who described those species were using the best evidence available to them, evidence that came from a herbarium specimen, to, to hypothesize that that was a new species. But it's field work that showed us that these things were all different. And it also seems to not be related to the environment. Field work also allows you to look at plants in their environment and say, oh, well, this is small because it's growing in quite a dry place, or to, or to hypothesize that. But looking at, at, at this particular species, that wasn't the case. In the sacred valley of Cusco in Peru, which was the center of the Inca Empire, which was famously overrun by the Spaniards as the, as the Europeans, quote unquote, discovered the New World and managed to, to pillage it beyond recognition, is in the sacred valley, there's another species of selenum which grows, which has purple flowers and is a vine. Now, this is just a picture of some of these things, and we're still really confused about this is this thing grows as, as a vine, as I said, and sometimes it has tiny little inflorescences with just a few flowers in each inflorescence up there in the top. Sometimes it has great big inflorescences. Sometimes it has big flowers. Sometimes it has small flowers. Sometimes it has simple hairs on the stems. Sometimes it has branched hairs on the stems. And this was all a, is a complete mess. So we spent a lot of time going from place to place and mapping out where all these different characteristics occurred in this quite large area. And we're still not sure what the right answer is, because there's all these names associated with all of this variation. Loads of different names. You can see a man named Bitter named three of these specimens. Now, these names float around. And one of the jobs of someone, a person like me, the kind of plant scientist I am, is to make sense out of these names and figure out what we're going to call a species. And one problem we have is that many of these type specimens of these names were held in a herbarium in Berlin, which was, this, which was a direct hit by Allied bombing in the Second World War and burned up, which means all of those type specimens are gone. So we have no way of knowing what these things actually refer to. 
So what we did on our, in our plant hunting field trip is we went to the type localities, the place where somebody, the person who had first collected that plant, which was used as a type specimen, remember half of the names are only known from the, type, the single first collection. We went back and recollected in that area to try to figure out what that name was. And you can't do that without going in the field. So now we have material from all of those places, and we're going to sequence these once I get the permit for genetic resources. And then we won't know the answer, but we'll have another bit of evidence with which to test our hypothesis. The environment is really, really complicated. And the environment plant interactions about which we'll hear more today in a much more detailed way can be quite complicated. But in the field, it's important to look at real environment interactions with plants along a broad range of taxa. But we have to remember all the time that calling something a species doesn't mean the story is over. It's a hypothesis about the distribution of variation in nature. All those names that applied to that purple thing, which if they're all the same, it's going to be called Selenum pallidum, they were somebody's idea about what variation meant in nature. But going in the field allows you to look at it in a much more detailed way. So was that thing new? Is this thing? which we previously thought was something called Selenum americanum, but turns out we think it's completely different. Some very odd thing found only in dry valleys in Peru, in all the dry valleys in that tropical dry forest. Is this a new species? We need evidence from the field, from molecular sequences, and all kinds of evidence to be able to tell us that. Plants also do incredible things that you notice in the field. This is Eucalyptus monogyna, the tallest organism in the world. And this is a plant which we collected in the Altiplano in Argentina, which is doing its entire reproductive cycle the size of my thumbnail. It has a bud, a flower, and a fruit. Now, that's pretty incredible that plants can do all those. And think about the variation in body size that that involves. Vertebrates don't do that. Vertebrate body sizes don't vary that much. And plants can live in some pretty extraordinary habitats, habitats you would think that nothing else is going to live in. This is a sand dune, again, at 5,000 meters in the high elevation in Argentina. And this is a species of Solanaceae, which grows only there. So field work allows us not only to look at variation, look at the distribution of variation, try to construct hypotheses about the environment and the plant, but it also can show us some of the extremes to which plants can go, which those of us working in labs and things know about, but actually seeing a plant really growing in one of these extraordinarily dry places, you realize they can do it. They do things like edaphic variation. But the world, as John very clearly showed, is changing very, very quickly. The world is changing quickly, not, in, not only in terms of habitat destruction and change in population, but just in terms of the different things we can do and the different ways in which we interact with our environment. This is a picture of deforestation on the border of Brazil and Peru in 2010. And the wispy white stuff is not clouds. That's smoke from burning from deforestation. So you can see that anywhere where there's a road, the agricultural frontier is expanding very rapidly. Now, Brazil, in particular, has made great strides in limiting deforestation because forests are one of the places that allow, are a carbon sink. Forests are one of those things that we need to combat climate change. If you looked at the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was published in 2005, we can look at all the different habitats on Earth. And these are the five main drivers of biodiversity loss. So this isn't about us. This isn't about our species. Food security is kind of about our species. It's about our particular species. But this is about other species. And those drivers are habitat change, climate change, invasive species, overexploitation, and bringing up that theme again of agriculture is pollution with nitrogen and phosphorus. And that comes mostly from agriculture. So you can see that the arrows are mostly going up. The colors are mostly dark, which means that there is a continuing or increasing impact from those drivers and that the impact over the last century has been relatively high. And this is happening in every single one of the habitats on Earth. And what's important about looking at this in a habitat sense is that the plants actually are the matrix in which Earth's habitats are formed. Plants are that matrix in which the rest of biodiversity sits. So it's not just tropical forests that are under threat. It's all of plant diversity. 
But looking at it another way is what do we do about it? What, what, what can we do about that? How can plant science help? And another thing that I pulled from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment when I analyzed it for, for DEFRA was that this tiny quote, which is embedded way within the report, is that a major obstacle for knowing about and using the biodiversity of a region, and this is important, sustainably using, and this is sustainably using not only in the kind of scientific sense, but also in the food security sense and in the, in the sustainable use way, is human and institutional capacity to research a country's biota. So that means people are really important in all of this equation, not only people to do particular pieces of research, but institutional and human capacity to research a country's biota, to know about what a country has and the diversity of it and how it interacts. And this is true not only in Peru, where the bottom photograph is taken, but also here in the United Kingdom. No, teaching about plant diversity as well as plant science, plant diversity as part of plant science is really important not only in the developing world, but also in the developed world. So we could end with this cartoon. How many species do I need, says the man. And I, the alert amongst you will note there's not a single plant in that picture. And I would argue that maybe we ought to think not about how many species we as individuals need, or how many species we as, individual, as an individual human species might need, but what plant diversity actually does for us. And in order to know what it does for us, we need to also at the same time be looking into what it actually is and how it interacts with the rest of biodiversity. Because this is a green and blue planet, but it won't remain a green and blue planet for very long if we continue to exploit it at the rate we are, but also if we continue to ignore the other 500 million species with which we share it. And that relies on exploration. And it relies on exploration, not in the plant hunting, kind of having adventures in the Amazon and Andes way, but in targeted exploration, which allows people to document something very carefully and making those data available for others to use in, in ways that the person who collected them might not ever have thought of. Because plants, just like weather, can give you all kinds of surprises. So thank you very much. Questions? Alison Smith from the University of Cambridge. Um, just to go back to your comment right at the beginning, you said there were six species that we rely on. Can you see, this, this might be a tangential leap, can you see the work that you do providing some clues as to some other species that we could um, start to exploit? I, I, th I think I, I can sort of see it, but, but it's a long way from it. So, that, so the chain between what I do and the kind of let's exploit other species is extremely long. But I think critical to that chain is actually having data available and having data openly available about where things grow and also people taking proper information in the field. I mean, I am continually shocked when I go into herbaria around the world and discover that people aren't putting geographical coordinates on things they collect, which is the prerequisite for getting it onto that kind of Europe, America -centric, centric map for the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So I, I guess I, I think, I like to hope that it will be, but I can't, I've never seen it happen. But you know, that things take a long time.